Welcome everyone to In Conversation With. Um, this is a casual discussion, um, basically around studying in the UK in the current times. Um, with us we've got um, Vivian Stern, the Director of Universities UK International, um, represents I think 139 UK universities and activity around the world. Um, we've also got Sadiq Basha, who's the CEO and founder of Edvoy, which is an edtech um, platform, help find the university in course of your dreams. Um, also founder of um, IEC Broad, which is a student recruitment company, um, an English language school, NCG, and a digital agency, which is Zudo Innovations. Um, I've also got Bobby Mehta, um, he's the director of University of Portsmouth Global, um, overseeing all sort of external operations for that university, and also um, serves as chair of the British University's International Liaison Association. I think fondly known as Wheeler, more commonly, because <laughs> um, that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, my name is Matt. I, I work for um, as part of the Edvoy team, um, and I'll just be hosting and and just asking the questions to our panelists. Um, the the theme of this this event is ask away. Um, there's a Q and A button that you have. Ask any questions you've got. Um, in here, we've got in this chat, we've got a lot of expertise um, from the UK education industry. Um, so all your questions, any reservations you have about, about studying in the UK, whether it be in a few weeks in a, or in a year, um, ask away and we'll, we, can, we can try and answer. And if we can't answer, we'll try and get answers um, and we'll send some, some content and some comms out afterwards uh, with any answers that we couldn't, we couldn't answer as well. Um, so really, it's all about just giving you the reassurance that you need um, for studying in the UK. So... Um, I think we'll just we'll just jump in and, and start. There's obviously um, a lot that the UK government has has just announced new measures in the UK, um, which might not translate well overseas to our, our potential students coming from, from abroad as obviously they don't see the British news. So um, I think this question first to, to Vivian is, uh, what is the UK government doing to assist international students during this time? Well, I mean, the, the government has been very supportive of international students right from the very start of the pandemic. I mean, many of you will know that the current Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has always been fiercely pro international students. And I should say he's got a particularly strong sort of personal uh, connection and affinity with India. Um, and since he took up his post, we've seen uh, the government take a number of steps to make the UK. Uh, more attractive to welcoming of and supportive of international students. So the introduction of the graduate route, which was announced last September, uh, further improvements to that, allowing PhD students to stay uh, for up to three years compared to the two years that's available for most uh, um, graduates. And then when the pandemic hit, we um, very rapidly convened a government which brought together us as the sector, Bobby was part of that group, and all of the government departments that we needed to work with us to make sure the system worked for students, which meant that we were able to take the things that were troubling students, you know, the, the things that they needed the visa system to be able to do because, uh, you know, travel was restricted, because, uh, you know, the conditions had changed. Um, right through to working to anticipate what this autumn was going to be like, making sure that visa application centres were open, that the visa rules uh, were sufficiently <coughs> flexible to accommodate the kind of changes to the way that teaching and learning is being delivered. And I think from, um, from the <coughs> beginning of the pandemic, we felt like one team. And our shared and uh, constant objective is to make sure that those international students who choose the UK they get looked after. Now we can't magic away the pandemic and it, and it obviously is a huge challenge. Um, and I'm sure during the course of this webinar, we'll talk about how it will change the experience for international students. But I can tell you that from the beginning of March, uh, we have had a pretty good team working flat out, both at the national level and within universities to make sure that everything that can be done is done to make sure that international students are safe, they're looked after and that the policy framework is right for them. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with that, Vivian, because uh, what we were also seeing is that team approach wasn't just a team approach between ourselves and government and universities. It was between our agent network <laughs> students. So what we were seeing was whatever was happening 
out there in country was being fed back to the universities, immediately fed back to organizations like UUKI, Beulah, etc. And then government were at the same meetings hearing what was going on and reacting to that. So the speed at which we were operating in, in, in a pandemic situation was incredible, absolutely incredible. And that made such a difference. I, it, within a matter of weeks, we would see uh, there's this issue over here. You know, we, we saw, for example, when the VAX reopened the visa processing centers, there were a number of uh, hiccups or uh, small issues. As soon as those were highlighted, we spread that into government and immediately the response that we were seeing was so quick and those were addressed and they, they went away. So we'd go from one week where we raise an issue to the next week to say, oh, that's not an issue anymore. Yeah. And so re refreshing and such a, a great way to work. And I think that really highlighted the importance that uh, everyone places uh, and particularly the government places on, on international students and how they want to welcome international students to the UK. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to flip that around and I think I'll, I'm going to go to you again, Bobby, just first, and then we'll get Sadiq's inputs on this. So what have universities done to, to help international students? So obviously, uh, initially, uh, when the lockdown came uh, back in March, we were thinking, oh, this is going to be for three weeks. And we were going into a three week lockdown. And oh, that's OK. That's not too bad. Uh, but gradually, uh, uh, the reality set in. And, uh, you know, we sit sort of six months plus later and uh, we're still working in a, a COVID world uh, with the virus uh, still prevalent uh, across the globe. Uh, so what universities did, and, and I'm very proud of uh, the, the higher education sector in the UK, they were very agile uh, and uh, they reacted really quickly. Uh, they moved uh, uh, to remote teaching initially. So you know, the university campus closed down, uh, academic colleagues went online to make sure that the students that were already uh, studying and completing their programs or in the first or second year of programs were able to complete their, their studies and completed that online. Uh, assessments were changed from face-to-face -face exams, etc., to online exams or online assessments. So all of those transitions were made really, really quickly. Uh, whilst that was all happening, uh, universities changed their well-being and support systems to be able to do that remotely. Uh, so universities reacted uh, really, really quickly and, and, and put it uh, into place. And the reason they were able to do that because a lot of uh, the technologies, the virtual learning platforms, et cetera, were all in place already. So universities were always using these platforms, but not to the same degree that they may be using them now. So the, the tools were available and the universities were equipped uh, to be able to, to make that transition. And as uh, we look forward, uh, and we know that the pandemic is definitely going to be with us for a, a little while longer, uh, universities have taken the, the lessons that they've learned and the approaches that they put in place back in uh, March uh, as they went into lockdown and have carried those forward and looked at how they can improve things and take things even further uh, in terms of ensuring that uh, students, not just international students, but all students get a first class education experience regardless of what happens as we go into lockdown or deal with the pandemic uh, and regardless of where students are whilst they're uh, learning. Cool. Um, Sadiq, obviously, um, in, your, in your position, um, working over multiple education sector businesses, um, you probably see a, a high view of what, what universities are doing. Is there anything that, that you've seen that you, you really think is, is great um, that, that some universities have been doing? I mean, I, what I, I, must, I must commend the UK universities on the whole, the way they pull the resources to ensure the students, staff, and the local community safety and well-being as a paramount, that is commendable. I've seen universities, you know, helping students to deliver some foods. I've seen university, for example, Southampton University, where when the, when the university decided to go online, um, you know, all of a sudden, some of the students didn't have laptops. I've seen university distributing laptops. Uh, Southampton did that. I've seen universities there. Uh, you know, giving rent away for students who want to go back to their families uh, of accommodation. So universities have been very helpful. And, and some of the students from India and parts of Asia, 
who were planning to come in May intake for some universities and then even some for September 20. So they, they were flexible enough to offer them deferred option. So, and also um, some students could not take an um, IELTS exam uh, if they want to join September intake this month. The university have gone more flexible and giving them an option of Duolingo and, and, and other tests. So on the whole, I, I would say the, the, you know, we've been in the, six, in the sector for the last 16 years. And the UK universities have, uh, have embraced the, the, you know, and, and we're very quick. And just to conquer what uh, uh, Bobby said, the university are very agile and, the, and they adapted to the very changing, evolving situation that what was yesterday is different today. And I'm sure it's going to be different tomorrow. So, so my message is uh, the university have done a great job. Um, the students can, uh, can trust the UK university's uh, approach uh, to this pandemic. Cool. It's, um, it's, really, it's really good to hear the, the practical things as well as the sort of the, the teaching side, but also the life side, like you said, right. students not being able to, to afford rent or, or get their IELTS and things like that. It's really great to see, see a lot of those more practical student, student focused um, solutions from universities. We've got a question. Um, we might end up coming to it later, but I'm going to ask it now, um, as is the, the theme, is just ask away. Um, Jesha has asked, how will the six individual indoor rule apply to universities? Um, so the rule of six that the UK government has, um, has put, put out recently. Um, Bobby, what, what yes. are your thoughts on that? So uh, universities, obviously this has come in in the, the last few weeks, uh, the, the new rule of six, and uh, as we go forward, that, that may change, that may uh, go up or it could go down. Uh, so we'll we'll have to, as uh, Sadiq says, we need to be agile about the, the way we deal with it. But what universities have done is is they're following the uh, government guidance. They're working with public health, uh, England or Wales or Scotland uh, and the relevant authorities uh, in Northern Ireland as well. And they're making sure uh, that the, they give the students the latest guidance and the latest advice that the government's giving. So that's number one. Then depending on the, the size of the campus, whether it's a city campus, whether it's a, a, an off city campus, uh, et cetera, they're basing uh, the guidance on uh, facilities that are available. They're, they're making plans to make, make sure that all the, the measures are in place. So the social distancing measures, you will see if you go to any campuses that they have all the social distancing. If students have to wait in a, to get into a room, there's the adequate distancing is there in classrooms, in lecture theatres if they're being used. They're all done uh, according to the social distancing measures that have been put in place. So all of that uh, advice and guidance is being followed and, you know, the, the expectation is that uh, students will do that. And uh, it's, it's a two-way street. So universities are, are putting these measures in place, but then the expectation is students will follow them. And it's a, it's a partnership between the students and the university to make, make sure that uh, we are able to do uh, exactly what the, the government's advising. And, and, the reason it's really, really important for us to do that is we need to make sure that we don't spread uh, the virus any further. And we know within uh, university communities being, you know, uh, s small communities uh, where lots of interactions between students take place, uh, both in classrooms and outside in social uh, activities as well. But we students have to follow the guidance that's been given and, and uh, abide by it. So that's the, the message the universities are putting across. That's the, the sort of infrastructure that we're creating uh, based on the, the advice and the guidance from the government. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I can share a, a link uh, for uh, people to have a look at in, in the chat. So I've just put a link here. So this is how we are advising students uh, at Portsmouth. Um, uh, about their studies when they come to, to Portsmouth this year and how things will be different this year in comparison to previous years. So we are, we, we're giving this type of guidance and you will see within this page that there is lots of advice and um, guidance uh, linking back to what the government is saying and what the latest government advice is as well. So that, that's kind of the approach we're taking at Portsmouth and I'm seeing it across the UK. Yeah. Um, I posted in the chat for some more Q&As and now we've got loads, which is great news. Um, I've also, um, just to our attendees, I've just posted a, a poll um, while 
while Bobby started speaking there just around um, the UK government um, and, and do we feel that the UK government is listening and prioritising um, the needs of international students? Um, if, you, if you answer that poll, um, we can obviously, we'll look at that information and we'll be able to um, talk, talk about it later as well, which is great. Um, most of it's yes at the minute, which is good. <laughs> um, cool. Um, I'm just going to go back to some more our plan questions um, and then we'll come back on to, there's a Q&A that's it's a, it's a real good one. Um, so I'll keep that one for later. <laughs> um, Vivian, how prepared are universities to teach some elements of their courses online if necessary? So, I mean, as Bobby says, we've now had quite a bit of time or universities have had quite a bit of time to think through um, what they can do online and what they can do face to face. And I know that most universities um, are planning a degree of face to face um, uh, teaching, especially where uh, access to specialist facilities, to labs, to maker spaces, to studios, to technical facilities are required. So. Um, most universities will have thought through how they can provide that in a safe way. Um, as Bobby said, the rules might change, but for now, um, the uh, plan is to combine, in most universities, the, the, the plan is to combine um, the sort of quite now quite um, well-developed methods of online instruction with, um, you know, small group teaching, seminar teaching, I think in the last week or so, Many of universities have been looking again at that and working out how to make sure that in the new circumstances it's still as safe as possible. Um, and every university is a little bit different. Um, but I suppose one of the things that, um, well, two things. One, one of the things that we've um, discovered since March when universities had to put teaching online uh, very quickly is that the, um, the, the you know, it, 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 it's got some upsides. There were um, I think a lot of fears right at the beginning that students would be sort of stuck in a bedroom, uh, you know, receiving pre-recorded lectures and there would be very little kind of interaction between student groups. And that's not actually the way it's worked out. So, um, you know, you talk to students who are having, you know, very good active discussion sessions in the kind of way that we're doing today, you know, through online platforms where they can, uh, they can keep the kind of debate that you need as a student going um, and interact both with fellow students and their staff. Um, and I think that's very important. So you're not just sitting there kind of receiving something that is a, a, a sort of poor relation to the kind of teaching you would get if you were in the same room as people. Um, and of course, the universities have had to plan for students being in different um, situations. So you might have a cohort of students in which some students are there on campus. They're coming in for some small group teaching or to access specialist facilities. Um, but some of their classmates are you know, studying fully online because for whatever reason they're self-isolating or in some cases they may not have arrived in the UK to begin with in the, in the first uh, couple of weeks of the course. So universities are going to have to plan to deliver teaching in, in this quite flexible way, acknowledging that students are going to be in different situations. But there are certainly some good things that have come out of it. And I do hear students who say um, that they find it a bit easier to kind of pipe up, to ask, ask questions, to sort of put themselves forward in discussion when they're in this sort of online space compared to being in a classroom where they maybe feel a bit inhibited. So, so, so that's, um, uh, you know, I think that's interesting to watch. Um, the, one of the things that I, I sort of want to make sure people are aware of, we've launched a campaign called We Are Together. Um, and the idea of the campaign is to get current international students. So students who are already with us, who might be continuing programs that they, you know, they started last year, or people who are just arriving this autumn, to tell us about their experience. And we've got lots of universities who are participating in this, and they're getting their students to record really short videos that just explain what it's like studying through the pandemic. And all of that stuff is on Instagram. We've got the, you can find it at wearetogether underscore UK. And I mean, I guess my point is, um, that's a way that we've tried to make sure that future students understand from the experience of current students what it's going to be like. Um, and the final thing I would say is talk to the individual university because they'll tell you what, um, you know, what to expect. And as Bobby said, it might change a bit over the coming weeks because obviously we're sort of in this period where government's guidance is changing a little bit. Um, I think that's great. Yeah, the, the We Are Together campaign as well. We've, um, I think everyone 
in this um every panelist has supported that that campaign um and um we'll, we'll be we're actually creating a, a video which is um from one of our students which is a bit of a day in the life of um so actually going around and, and we'll be able to show you the the different things that, that um, the University of Huddersfield in particular has has put in place. So put screens, hand sanitizing stations and stuff. So um, we'll send that we'll send it out to all of the, the participants once it's ready. But I think that's like you said, it's, it's good candid view of, you know, from a student. Um, so it's a good campaign and, to put together. And the other thing, Matt, is the kind of social side, because I mean, my niece, my 18 year old niece is off to university on Friday. She's going up to Dundee. And, you know, I guess one of the questions she's got is what's the social life going to be like? Because she's worried about that rule of six and she can't obviously do the things that, that you know, would perhaps have been quite normal last year. Um, and I think getting students to describe from, you know, first hand experience how they're beginning to make friends with fellow international stu with fellow students, you know, especially if you're coming from abroad and you don't have a social network. That's really important. So. You know, we know lots of universities have got kind of plans to help sort of international students who are arriving in the UK for the first time make friends. But we're just hoping that the We Are Together campaign will help students see what that like really means in practice. And also maybe spread good ideas around. So if one university is doing something particularly brilliant, well, you know, we want to get that out there so other universities can learn from that. Yeah, and pick it up. We've actually um, just got a question, just literally as, as we were talking about that, saying um, what happens during Freshers' Week? Is it going to be online as well? Um, I'm going to throw that out to, to any of you <laughs> um, if you've got an answer. But Bobby, Bobby literally raised his hand then, so go on, Bobby. <laughs> Just uh, posted another link uh, which shows uh, it's a link to our orientation program. So what we've done, and many universities across the UK are doing something similar, is we've done uh, a free pro uh, method approach. So we've taken... We're doing some face-to-face -face events wherever possible, uh, so that, that's that's one part of it. We're then doing um, online, so we're doing live sessions online. We're doing uh, breakout networking uh, sessions online, and then we're doing an on-demand service as well. So what, whatever you miss in terms of the online, you can also get uh, any time. It'll be recorded, and you can watch that yourself uh, in your own leisure. You know, if you happen to miss a session because you're on your way to campus, uh, traveling uh, by plane or whatever, you'll get it on the on-demand service. So lots of universities have taken that uh, type of approach. And we recognize that, as Vivian was saying, that students will have different experiences based on their individual circumstances, where they are. Some will be traveling to the UK, some will uh, be in isolation once they get here for a couple of weeks. So we've designed this program and we've tried to make it as interactive as possible, a variety of things that are going on to help students to have that opportunity to network as well. Because one of the things we know uh, when you come to university, as Vivian uh, used the example of her niece, you, it's the social side of things. And, you know, uh, through the social side of things, you often make lifelong friends. Uh, and in some cases, you know, uh, you even meet your partner at uh, university and, uh, and, and get married and, and, and set up a family together. So that, that networking side of it and, and meeting people uh, is, is really important. And we've really uh, emphasized that as much as we can using the virtual environments and, and uh, virtual technologies that we've, we've got available. There's a, a certain irony, isn't there, in a digital generation demanding offline learning and an offline industry going online. <laughs> it's a full, a full 180. I, I really enjoy it. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting because I was, uh, I think I may have said this to Vivian already, but I was talking to my son and my son's 13. So he's obviously, he, he went through the initial lockdown where he was learning at home. Now he's gone back to school with all the social distancing and all the, all the measures in, in place. And he, uh, just one evening, he came home and we were talking and uh, he was reflecting. And he said, well, I think I learned really well in the online environment, you know, because I could do <laughs> things, I could go further, I could do it at my own pace and all, all the rest of it. But I really enjoy being back at school because I get to see everyone and the social aspects. So it, it's also interesting. And I think for the, the university sector, as we move forward, we online has always been there and online has been there in, in terms of technology, in terms of uh, the, the, a, a way of learning. But the, the, the interactions between the, the two now, and at the moment we've gone really online uh, at the moment because of the situation we're in. But 
I often see student want, students wanting and the, even the younger generation wanting that social interaction as well. And, you know, they see that almost as an integrated part of their learning because of what they get from their peers, etc. cetera. So uh, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how things move forward. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic at the moment. Yeah, it's, um, how many times have we heard the word Moodle in the past decade <laughs> working in this industry, yeah. you know? Yeah. I can't disagree with that, uh, uh, Matt, you know, when students come to the university, academic is one one element. It's the experience of making friends. And as Bobby mentioned, it's a long term. I remember me coming to the UK 18 years ago. Excitement was, uh, apart from the academic and the world class education, making new friends, diversity, mm -hmm. cultural diversity, um, and, and, and the facilities. I mean, I've seen some of the universities have already you know, started um, opening up, you know, a lot of all the universities are opening the campuses and within the social distancing norms, you know, they've put strict measures in place as long as the students cover their, you know, they put the mask on, they have sanitized all over and they follow the one way navigation system and then they, they meet the they student, the friends, fellow friends within that social distancing. Um, I think they have the best of the world of worlds. We're going to a new world order now. It's a new new norm. So I think the students are getting prepared to the new norm. So, so it's a new challenge uh, ahead of us. For sure. I think I've, I might have a question that's quite related um, to this. I'm sure. So, oh, here we go. Yeah. So, so um, Zainab asked, um, if we study online, um, will that be noted in like their degree certificate or anything like that? Um, Bobby. <laughs> go, go on. <laughs> so I, I don't think it will be. Uh, so usually you have two types of courses, one which is the on-campus course and one which is an online course. So usually if you sign up and you uh, are studying for the online course, then it would say online and it would reflect. Or if you study at one of the overseas partners or university campuses, for example, it would say the campus name, etc. The intention is uh, with this academic year in, uh, is that you would be studying an on-campus course uh, you're starting in an online mode uh, and depending on the university and what they've decided you may uh, continue with that uh, to a certain degree but you're, it's part of the university on-campus experience and therefore I would expect it would be, be the normal degree certificates that you'll be receiving however what I would advise all students to do is to double check that with the university. It's a good question and it's a, definitely worth double checking with the university. But from the University of Portsmouth side, ours would be, um, you're coming to study an on-campus course, you're starting uh, uh, remotely possibly to start with um, and online and, and therefore your degree certificate wouldn't say anything different. Yeah. Matt, just, yeah. just, I'll go, go just, Vivian first and then, and then we can go uh, to speak. Thank you. Just to add to that, and um, the, um, the one of the things that I think students will be worried about is, you know, will the employer, they, when they graduate and they take this uh, degree certificate to employer, is, there, is the employer going to think somehow this was a lower quality degree? You know, was, it, was this not proper university? And I think that um, it will be quite important to make the best use you can of the career services. Every UK university has a career service and they do things like they help students to um, to um, perfect the way they describe what they have learnt to a prospective employer. And in this, in this current climate, I think that will also include making sure they've got a really good way of describing how the way that they studied and what they achieved um, is of exactly equivalent quality to what would have happened if they were studying face to face. And I think that what students will need to do as they prepare for graduation is to make sure that when an employer sitting on the other side of that interview table said, well, that, that wasn't really the experience that you would have got if you'd been able to study face to face. They've got a great answer and they can talk about the way that they use digital technology to interact with fellow students, to debate, to, uh, to you know, fully participate in, in university life in different ways. And the additional skills they will have developed as a result, because you've got to have a good story when it comes to sitting in front of an employer and persuading them that you're the best candidate. But all UK universities are kind of set up to help you do that. And, and I would say, because I'm not sure. I did this when I was at university. From the first day you set foot on campus, find out what the career service can do for you and make sure you're asking what sort of support they can provide because I think people often think about that quite late in their university careers. Brilliant. Um, Steve, do you have anything to, to add on that? Yeah, I just concur with what uh, Vivian said. Actually, that's what that was in my mind. Um, 
I mean, most of the universities have been very clear from day one when, when, when they all went online that um, you know the degree will be you know as as normal accepted and um, and it will say as normal degree and the students starting from September onwards uh, it's a blended approach as most of the universities have gone in a blended approach so they you know they can study for a semester and then if things are in a better situation the students are allowed to travel in fact a lot of the students are even traveling now as we speak. We've seen students coming to uh, Manchester, Liverpool, and Portsmouth, um, as long as they quarantine themselves and then follow the social distancing measures, and um, and then they 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 go on to start doing these courses in a blended manner on campus and online within the country. Just to add, in terms of a career, um, uh, what Vivian mentioned, um, one of the a lot of the international students don't understand the importance of career centres. They really help you to understand how to face the employer once you know once you graduate. Um, I strongly recommend the international students um, visit your career center first. Try to you know know what what is available as an international student. Uh, even if you decide to not to work or work in in the UK or not, at least you get really really good understanding how to face confidently uh, wherever you come from, which part of the world you decide to work. Brilliant. Um, uh, um, the other uh, thing that we should bear in mind in terms of recognition, uh, a lot of governments, um, uh, the ministry uh, in different countries, the ministries of education have actually recognized uh, that there is a global pandemic and that they are, are happy for students to initially start their programs online and to work with universities based on what the, the universities have decided. So there is also uh, the support from governments across the, the globe uh, for the approach that the UK universities are, are taking. So again, there's some reassurance there as well. Brilliant. Um, well, um, we were all chatting and I, I actually launched a poll, I don't know if you saw, just um, around whether, whether our attendees feel confident about the value of a degree from a UK university. Um, so attendees, if you could answer that, um, Answer that honestly. That would be that would be great because um, you know this sort of shows where where there might be gaps. As as Vivian said, um, it could be the case that people feel it's less value, um, which I don't think will be the case. But if people think that, then you know we know we need to go and speak to universities and um, and reassure reassure students. Um, cool. I've got so many Q and A's, guys. Oh, there's loads. Um, I'm just going to a lot of them are actually similar to our prepared questions. So I'm just going to start firing through some. Um, there's some really relevant ones, um, and I'm just going to I'm just going to go to to Vivian on this. Um, what would it mean for international students um, if there's a new lockdown put in place? Right. Well, uh, this could happen, and we've seen a couple of universities uh, which have already experienced this, and, and Scotland is a good example. And um, we all knew that this was a possibility, and universities have been planning for this for several months. Um, we've also been through it, of course, you know, we had students on campus during the first lockdown um, earlier this year um, our universities never closed. I mean, you know, there were always students on campus. We had international students in particular still living in halls, studying from, uh, you know, the, the places they were living before. Universities became very good at making sure things like um, access to food, if you can't go out to uh, shop. Uh, because you're self-isolating, access to healthcare. There have been questions in the chat about access to healthcare. All universities will have, um, you know, systems in place to support students who fall ill and make sure, of course, that you've got access to the NHS, which uh, I think if you don't know about uh, how the healthcare system works in the UK, I'm just going to post in the chat a link to um, a, an organisation Bobby and I work very closely with uh, called UKESA. This is the UK Council for International Student Affairs. What I've posted there is advice on living in the UK during coronavirus. Within that, there's information about all of a lot of the things that people have asked, including access to healthcare and, of course, um, visa arrangements. But um, we know that universities have prepared for this. They've planned for it. Uh, universities have good relationships with local public health authorities to make sure that testing can take place. Actually, at the national level, we're working to make sure that that is, uh, you know, that all of the arrangements are in place so people don't have to, for example, tr travel long distances, which has been a little bit of a problem in the past. Um, and Bobby can describe the way that universities have gone above and beyond the call of duty to make sure that individual students, nobody is 
left uh, stranded without access to the services that they need. Yeah, so, uh, you know, what we're seeing at uh, universities across uh, the UK is, for example, if I use Portsmouth, we've got testing facilities on campus. We've got NHS uh, testing facilities which have been set up on university campuses. A number of universities are working in, in a similar way or working with their uh, local health authorities to make sure testing is, uh, is available for, for students. For example, um, I know a number of universities that have offered isolation. So when students come into isolation into the UK uh, for the 14 day period, they've offered that at the beginning of term for free. So they can even charge for that, that accommodation period. Uh, there's food parcels being provided while you're in isolation. So initially, for example, when students arrive at Portsmouth, we're in halls of residence or the private sector, they can contact us and say, look, we, we, we're in isolation. Can you provide uh, food parcels uh, for uh, the initial couple of days whilst they find their feet and, and they're able to support themselves? So all of these types of things are available. We learnt a lot of lessons from the first time around when we went into lockdown. So I think universities are were, reacted really well under those circumstances, but we know what to expect. And it's not only the universities know what to expect, students know what to expect. Everybody knows what to expect. So even uh, it's not going to be a question of, you know, at, at the beginning you would have seen headlines of uh, everyone running to the shops to buy toilet paper. Uh, I don't think we're going to see the same issue this time around. <laughs> hopefully, because everyone knows the toilet paper didn't run out. Uh, so, you know, the supply chains, etc., we know are robust and can deal with, with this based on what government put in place. So I think uh, that we're going to be much more prepared this time if we need to go into a lockdown. And I think it's the same is true in any country across the globe. Uh, the, it, it, the, there will be second waves, there will be potentially third waves, fourth waves, who knows, uh, until the vaccine is, is there. But we're, we're in a much better place. We know what we're dealing with. We know the effects. And uh, I think together, uh, the student community, the, the university community, uh, the, the community that we are in, uh, whether it be in universities or, or further afield, as long as everyone's doing their part and, and, right. and maintaining the social distancing, the hygiene measures, etc., I think everything will, will, will work out and uh, I do have to say, Matt, though, I mean, one of the things you'll get told by the university that you're arriving to study with is that taking those, um, those rules seriously is quite important. So, you know, no university wants to be uh, welcoming international students with a big long list of rules about things you can't do. But unfortunately, in the current circumstances, you will get a bit of that. And we will, you know, we, we will see universities uh, making sure that those rules are enforced. Yeah, I think... Um... You know, it's, we spoke about this just before we we um, we opened this as well. Is um, it's not it's not necessarily about customer at that point. It's a, you're part of the community, aren't you? You're part of a, a literal community of people um, who all live in a in a potentially new new city or and or country. Um, so so I, I do think that you know there's, there's give and take there. It's it's not like it's a, a necessarily a customer um, and supplier relationship. <laughs> Matt, Matt, just to add, I would recommend any student who is going to any university, please watch the COVID secure video of their, their university. Yeah. So all the universities have done their own videos. It's on YouTube, on the university website. It exactly explains how the university is managing, uh, running the whole campus, whether it's a one-way navigation system, mask and sanitizer, where it is, entry, exit, you know, um, and, and then temperature scanners, free bicycles, everything the university is explaining clearly on the video itself. We've had a lot of questions about this. Um, so, Steve, I'm, I'm going to come, come back to you. We've got questions around November intake. Will, it be, will there be implications in January intake? Um, so my question is, will coronavirus have ongoing implications for September 21, January 21, and um, the sort of the November intake as well? Yeah, as Bobby mentioned earlier, until we find a vaccine, the, the, the virus is going to live with us, and that's a reality. And we've seen in the past we had a, a few diseases in, you know, in, in, the lifestyle, in our lifetime, and, and, and it's, it's, it's just there. Um, so I think um, until the, the vaccine is found, we, we have to live with it as long as we follow the social norms, the guidelines set by the local governments. The universities have been very flexible, and, and a lot of the universities have started running the January intakes, I would see you know, a lot of universities. Historically, you only see 10 to 15% of the UK universities 
running few few number of courses. Now, I would say nearly 50 to 70% of universities are running reasonable size amount of uh, courses in January intake. And some of the universities have gone even further. Uh, you know, they're doing November intake, they're doing uh, April intake, May intake. Of course, not all courses, limited courses. So students can um, you know, follow um, and obviously they can contact our colleagues in via IC team if they need any advice, if they're not sure, if they've missed the September 20 intake, don't you worry, that's my message. Don't give up your ambitions. So, you know, January is not far away, it's only three, four months down the line. So, so if you can't make it now, for whatever reasons, restrictions and travel from your own country, you're not comfortable doing online, you want to be in the country, in the country do blended learning, fine, January 21 is there for you. Brilliant. Um... Vivian, have you got anything anything to add to that in terms of um, admissions and the well, I think um, that's right. I mean, the universities are also being quite flexible about start dates um, this uh, autumn. So, um, you know, a number of universities, uh, as Sadiq has said, have got January start dates. Um, but you just need to talk to um, the university that you're uh, planning to study with about the kind of options that are available, because some universities are going to let students start initially online from their home country and then come when they're able to travel and that that's sort of just I think um worth just understanding what what when when you would need to be on campus by in the case of each university uh, or if there are options to defer if if circumstances change I think the other thing is stay in touch with them during the period that you're sort of maybe uh, uh waiting um, because there are things you can do. If you're going to start a program, you're going to be absolutely flat out when you start that course. So maybe you can use the time to start reading ahead. Maybe you can start uh, doing things that will give you a head start when you, uh, when you actually embark on the course. So keep in touch with the university. I also think, uh, uh, Sadiq, in, in terms of students looking uh, at what, what their options are, I think there's a number of students that weren't sure whether they wanted to join in September and they were hoping that maybe by January or by uh, some later point, this virus would have gone away. Uh, but now they've seen the reality actually is the virus is probably here for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And even, even when the vaccine is available, it will take some time before everyone can get vaccinated. So it could be many months, uh, if not even well into next year, before we start seeing some real progress with this. And what I, I started to pick up is a lot of students say, well, I didn't come in September because I was hoping it would change. Now I'm changing my mind because I can see that this is a new way of living. Uh, that, you know, we're living with the COVID virus and we have to manage around it and, and keep ourselves safe and secure around that. So I, I need to continue with my education plan. So I think the fact that there are January intakes or other intakes, as you've mentioned, that gives students lots of options. And I would say, if you are in that category, uh, don't don't stop. You know, pursue your dreams and and, and pursue the your uh, courses that you want, and and everything will will continue. And Bobby's right. I mean, to be honest, we don't quite know what will happen later this uh, this autumn and winter. And you know, now for example, it's possible to get flights. You know, there are no um, there are no sort of travel restrictions in place. Um, and I, I don't think the UK is going to impose um, travel restrictions because we never did during the first wave. I mean, we're, unlike many countries, we never closed our borders, but other countries might impose travel restrictions. So, I mean, there is an ar argument, if you can, for just making the trip, getting yourself installed, um, adapting to the new normal uh, and not putting it off. Brilliant. Um, question related to that, actually, um, from an anonymous attendee. So I can't name drop them, unfortunately. Um, there are rumblings of some universities asking students to remain on campus over Christmas. Um, do we think that this is likely? And if so, what provision will universities make for international students? Um, Vivian. Well, I know? think, um, I mean, this is again, the, the, the answer to this question is talk to your university to see what they're saying. I mean, I think that universities at the moment are speculating about what might be uh, happening over Christmas. Um, and I think that um, it's just about thinking about the various scenarios that might, might unfold in most cases. Um, there, of course, was a period in the spring when it was difficult to travel to and from the UK because commercial flights weren't operating. So I think being prepared for the possibility that you may not be able to plan, you know, to go home when you, you might otherwise have done so is wise. 
I think as of this moment, I don't know what Bobby would say, but as of this moment, I think that um, the, there's no reason in most cases to think it would be impossible to go home if you wanted to. Um, but the autumn will unfold. I mean, Bobby, I don't know what Portsmouth is saying to students about Christmas. We, we, we've not come up with anything specific about Christmas uh, as such. I think it's still too early to tell. Uh, and, you know, things will change uh, in the next couple of weeks and definitely in the next couple of months uh, in terms of uh, we all hope things will be better and move in that direction and therefore there wouldn't be any restrictions. But equally, if there are, depending on what the situation is, uh, universities will be uh, agile, they will react, they will obviously look after the, the, the students mm -hmm. and ensure that uh, during uh, that uh, Christmas period, if, if indeed students are asked to stay behind or have to stay behind because of the situation, uh, we'll put things in place to, to make sure. And, you know, as we know, uh, living in the UK, things don't really close over the Christmas period anyway in terms of retail, restaurants, etc. So nothing, you know, if you are here in the UK and it's not possible to travel, what we've learned from the last lockdown uh, is that not everything was locked down. So shops were open, you were still able to do your grocery shopping, so you would still be able to live normally. And unfortunately, uh, to all the students out there that may be uh, planning to, to be with us from the September, the likelihood is over the Christmas vacation, you will have coursework to do as well. So there will be plenty <laughs> Stuff to be getting on with. So uh, unfortunately, uh, even if you decide you're going home uh, to be with family over the Christmas period, you'll still have lots of work to do. So um, I think in that sense, it's just about adapting to the situation and, and it will be the same uh, situation anywhere in the world. So uh, it'll just be a different point in time that different things are happening. So as we've seen throughout this uh, last six months. I love that. I love that um, Bobby just reckon a university just drops a reality check in there you will have coursework <laughs> <You have to work. laughs> um yeah it's, it's interesting in the uk things tend to open longer over christmas like retail stays open longer as well so um it's the opposite things don't really shut down um it's the final of our prepared questions and then and we'll move on to um the many questions we've got in the in the q a so sadiq how can international students best prepare for life in the uk with coronavirus like I mentioned before, before you come to the UK, please um, get in touch with your, uh, you know, if you're using Edmire service, get in touch with the Edmire consultants. They will give you all the information from the university. Visit the university website, watch the videos. Every university has an amazing video. I've seen Postman's video, I've seen other universities. It's great, explains to you step-by-step -step journey, traveling to the UK from the airport to isolation to measures within the campus. So please familiarize yourself. Also be, um, be prepared that uh, things are not going to be the same as it used to be. And, and that is a reality. And we talked about it, Bobby mentioned, Vivian mentioned, it's a new norm. And what that means, it's going to make you tough to deal with the challenging situation. When you graduate, I'll give you an example. We employed in Edvoy in the last two months four or five fresh graduates, some from the University of Manchester. Now, so one may think this is not the right time for graduates to graduate and find a job, but we, as, we have done it. So as you know, more and more employers are, are going down that route that the, it is a new challenging world. And, and so for that challenging world, the graduates and the international students who are coming out needs to be well prepared for that and to deal with it. So, so, so make sure that you are fully updated about the information locally, university, um, and follow the guidelines. Yeah, and just, just to add to, to that, Sadiq, um, actually, it's not going to be that different from where you're coming from, you know, because this is not a UK-centric uh, issue. It's a, it's a global issue. So, you know, what I saw quite early on in the pandemic uh, was in the UK, we didn't have to wear masks. But now wearing masks in public spaces, when you're outdoors, uh, going shopping, etc., is that now either a requirement or the new norm. Uh, so it won't actually be that different to what situation you find yourselves in in your home countries. So it is the way we are living at the moment globally. We're living, all of us are living with this virus. And as you come to the UK, um, you will see uh, that that's, that's continuing. And also just on Sadiq's point about employment, you know, once you've graduated, I saw a really interesting article uh, uh, just yesterday um, 
which talked about how graduates' uh, employment is still continuing to rise and the, the expectations is it will continue to rise uh, because businesses, uh, employers, etc., are still operating under this uh, new world. I think everyone's adapting and uh, uh, you know adjusting to working in this new world and, and still growing their businesses, etc. So I think it's um, you know the, that. It won't be that different from where you're, where you are right now, and where you're coming from. Um, so it should be fine. Vivian, have you got anything to add on that? Yeah, I just wanted to say I think that for graduates who are coming out um, into what may be a bit of a difficult labour market, I mean, it's good to hear Sadiq, uh, you know, expanding, and we've actually created jobs as a result of COVID as well in our team. Um, uh, we've taken on an international graduate, in fact, in our team to help with communicating with prospective students. So. Um, but I do think from the day you get on campus, think about how you are going to put yourself ahead of the pack when it comes to a tough labour market. There are things I think all students will need to really be aware of. So, for example, most students um, and including international students in the, in the past might have had expectations around supplementing their income whilst they were studying with a part time job. A lot of those jobs in the hospitality sector, they're just not there. So you have to be prepared for that and think about what you will do instead. Um, secondly, I think that there is a chance that we'll go through a period where it's harder to get a job as a new graduate. So make sure you get in touch with the university and find out what sort of support there is available for things like developing your own business. Lots of universities have um, structures in, pl in place to either help people to develop the skills to be an entrepreneur or to incubate a new business or, or to uh, start to make contact with the people that would help you do that. So. So beginning to be right from the beginning, quite sort of hard nosed about how you're going to prepare yourself for what could be a, labor, a difficult labour market, I think it's really important. But the good news is, I mean, I think UK universities take that very seriously. Um, you know, they do have professional career services. They are significant operations and they'll be, you know, they'll be thinking about how they're going to prepare their students for the labour market um, in the context of COVID. Um, so just make sure you, you sort of take advantage of all of that while you're here. Cool. Yeah, I know um, from my own experience that um, like the University of Manchester, for example, they're talking a lot about placements and things as well. So there's a lot going on behind the scenes in terms of how do we how do we place <laughs> all these students yeah. um, in, in the new in the new the new world. I've just um, launched a poll a few minutes ago um, just um, the question, do you have any concerns about seeing a degree in the UK during coronavirus? Um, we've got about half people have, um, have answered that. I, if you could answer that, if you put yes. Um, put in the Q and A what your concern is, and we'll we'll try and get to it. I know we've we've hit um, we've hit eleven now, but um, I think what we can do is we've got some open questions, and if if you guys are up for it, we could just do a bit more of a quick fire answers on these, and we'll just keep them nice and quick. But we'll um, we'll try and get through them to answer answer all these questions. So um, there's two questions from Angela. First of all. Um, and the first one is, um, is UK VI still exercising flexibility for students in the UK who need to renew their tier four visa, um, but it may have been delayed? Um, for example, the student's father has been delayed transferring money due to COVID issues in his country. Um, Vivian, have you got anything on that? Yeah, so I posted in the chat the UKESA link, go to that. It has exactly the answer to this question. It does depend on the date. Um, so uh, click on that link, look at the specific question, it will give you all the details. Also, because the Home Office has a kind of advice line for students who are for whatever reason stuck. Cool. Um, question two from Angela is, is also as UK BI. So will universities be able to continue accepting the alternative um, online language tests? So in this case, Duolingo was, was it hot in the press a few months ago. Um, is this actually a decision that was made by the university sector or was it a directive by UK VI? Uh, for me, yes, I mean, this was something we asked for, um, the flexibility. Um, I, th I think the intention was to remove that flexibility in the longer term. Um, but, but, you know, the circumstances being what they are, I think we might have to continue to be flexible. Um, so it's one to watch. Interesting. I think, um, Sadiq, have you got anything on that? I'm sure we saw an announcement recently about a university no longer accepting them. Um, what are your thoughts? Do you think that universities should continue? In my, in my opinion, I think universities should continue because um, exams like uh, Duolingo is very simple and students get the result within 48 hours. We've seen the success of those tests. 
I think the UK VI to an extent has given the, the rights to the university to decide. So some of the university, if they feel from the degree the students have studied back in their countries suffice the English language requirement, they've waived off those requirements of them. You know, they've done that. So some of them even have interviewed and they said, we are happy with that. So, so university have given a, a degree of uh, rights to make that decision. I'm sure Bobby would be able to answer this um, more than I uh, just add. Definitely for a uh, degree uh, and master level courses, universities can make their own decisions on uh, the, the English language. They just have to be sure that uh, the, they've tested or are happy with all four components uh, are meeting the UKVI threshold. So it is up to the universities. Every university will make a different decision. So I would advise all students to, to contact the, the, the university they want to, to go to. Uh, and uh, they will be able to advise them if, if the Duolingo test or IELTS indicator test or any of the other tests that they may have taken are still valid for future intakes. And that, but I agree with Vivian. I think we live in really uncertain times. So something uh, I would work with Vivian on, and other colleagues uh, uh, across the sector, is to speak uh, to the the Home Office and to lobby for that flexibility to to remain. Because whilst we go through these times, you know, we we could see lockdowns in other countries, uh, the closure of IELTS centres again. Uh, which will, you know, we, we don't want to have to go backwards to revisit all of this. So I think we know the situation we're in. Uh, we should continue with that flexibility. So that's something we can continue to push on. But in, in terms of the autonomy rests with the universities to make those decisions. So it's best to speak to individual universities. Oh, on, a, on a flip side, Matt, I would also like to add, for the benefit of international students, they they should prepare themselves with the English language language itself, especially writing. I've seen a lot of international students are very good in speaking. When they come and when when it's time to do a coursework or a thesis, they struggle to articulate and and do you know citations or paraphrasing. So so it's 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 very important the students understand the language skill is very important for them to pass the degree itself. They are they're also competing with their peers who are home students. Uh, or students who are, whose English is a their native language. So I was an international student myself 18 years ago. So before I came to this country, I was, you know, I tried my best to ensure that my writing skills is uh, to a standard where it should be. So that, that's the message I would give to international students. Please uh, work on your writing skills. It's very important. Yeah, don't, don't just tick the box, actually. <laughs> that's good. Um, next question. Um, this is actually based, this was a follow-on question from the online will online be on the certificate. Um, someone's asked, is there any discount? So I'm just going to flip that a little bit. Will, will tuition fees lower as a result of some of the courses being online? Um, should we go to Bobby on that? Yeah, my expectations and the discussions I've seen across the sector is there won't be any reductions in tuition fees. And, and that's for the simple fact that the academics who are teaching you are still the same academics. You're still getting access to the best minds and brains in the world who are uh, working at UK universities and also the, the, the infrastructures that you're getting access to, the, the journals, the libraries, the digital, all digital, they're all there, but the, all of those things are, are still the same things that you would have had access to on campus. So nothing's really changing. It's just the mode of delivery is slightly changing. Uh, and we, you know, a lot of universities are using the blended and connected uh, model, so that you still will get into the labs, you still will get into the workshops. It may be in a more socially distant way. And actually, the cost of this mode of delivery and the, the resource that's going into this mode of delivery is actually much higher uh, in many instances, in many cases. Because if you if you just take the simple example of if a lab can only now six people but before it could accommodate 30 people that is a big difference and therefore you have to have potentially more labs or you have to have uh, more timetabled use of those labs and all of that comes a, a, at an additional cost so actually universities will be subsidizing the study in 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 many ways in in this covid situation uh because of because of that uh, situation so i i don't expect to see any uh significant reductions in fees or anything like that uh, and vivian i don't know if you want to add to that 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's right. I think the the focus in the last few months has been making sure that you don't get a kind of second class education as a result of the change in the way things are studied. So universities have invested a lot in uh, in the sort of infrastructure and the technology to support online learning. Um, your academic staff will still be teaching you. It's not that you're getting uh, somehow uh, just static lectures, which are going to be uh, you know, lower cost for a university to develop. And as we've tried to explain, I think universities are doing all sorts of things they never had to do before to step in and support in international and domestic students um, through the crisis. So things like food parcels, no university delivered food parcels on any scale at all. I mean, I can't imagine the circumstances in which this would have happened before March. And they are now. They've invested hugely in things like mental health support. So the cost isn't going down for universities. And therefore, I don't think the cost will go down to students. But I think the question is, is it, is it still good value? And I, I'm pretty confident that it is. Yeah, I think um, probably the university sector has just also seen how, how expensive tech infrastructure is as well. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, um, it's not like that's all come from, from nowhere. <laughs> we, we also need to see the positive side of this as well. There is a positive side to this, uh, Matt. Um, I, I, I remember watching one of the videos you posted on Edvoy Global Instagram. One of a student from Leeds, I believe, a student from Palestine, Palestinian origin, or Jordan, I can't remember, saying that initially it was difficult. It was, didn't know the, how the online is going to look like. We thought it's tutorial, like uh, Vivian, it is not tutorial. It's a live session. The, the flip side, which is a positive side, is so you have a recorded version. Imagine if you missed a class, you didn't understand what the lecturer mm -hmm. was explaining. You can watch it again and again and again. You get out of, more out of it. Yeah, very true. That's um, really true. That I keep hearing from people that they, you know, what they, they, they do is if there's something they didn't really understand, they can go back and they can, you know, they can kind of, uh, they can gen up on it afterwards. I think that's quite exciting, really. Yeah, when, when I was at uni, people used to come in with like um, dictaphones or on their phones recording a lecture. And um, I think all this sort of the, the lecture hall. We all used to do that. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we just did it on smartphones at my age. Sorry. <laughs> Um, but yeah, now all those sort of lecture hall lectures will be freely available um, at any point, which, which is obviously brilliant. Um, next question um, is from 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 Gabor. Um, what can universities do to help when a student gets seriously ill um, from COVID or, or not from COVID? Um, it's important um, to know, given the new bottlenecks and restrictions in the in the UK healthcare um, system. I'll, I'll let anyone jump in on that one. <laughs> That's so no, go ahead, Bobby. So that's uh, basically if they get ill whilst they're here? Mm. Yeah. yeah. So uh, w what I've seen, uh, what we're doing at Portsmouth, there, there's a protocol to follow. Uh, if, you, if you fall ill, particularly with COVID symptoms, uh, the government has given detailed advice on, on the steps and procedures to follow. Uh, you will be able to get uh, access uh, to the National Health Service uh, and they will advise you. So there's helplines where you call, you tell them what your symptoms are, etc., and they will advise you what to do uh, from there. Depending on the severity of the symptoms, they may say, okay, in your case, you should just stay in isolation and this is what you should do. Uh, if it's more severe, they may say, well, we would recommend that you go get yourself to the hospital or ambulance or whatever, whatever the the situation may be and then also once you know what your situation is then you can also uh, contact the, the university and, and let them know and, and set those uh, procedures in place and what we've what we're seeing now is a lot of uh, good work between the uh, health authorities and the universities so there's communications going on there so if there is a need to put others into isolation or you know if they've others have been exposed potentially the, the virus, that, that those types of steps will be taken. Uh, and equally, whilst the student is going through those uh, situations, etc., um, the university will also look at measures to support them. Uh, so if they are in isolation, for example, how can we support them? What, do the, what does the student need? And there's helplines, etc., uh, available for students to contact. So at no point in time will a student just be on their own. They have the UK... Uh, infrastructure in terms of healthcare uh, and support, but then the university infrastructure. And in many universities and uh, cities, etc., you have the community infrastructure uh, around you to, to support as well. Matt, I was just going to add, I've, I've, I've posted in the chat UKIS's answer on access to healthcare. So hopefully make it completely clear that 
it's any treatment for COVID-19 is free. Uh, if you've got, uh, if you've paid the immigration search, health immigration surcharge, which you'll be asked to pay as part of the visa program, so you have access to the NHS uh, for free for other conditions too. But the other thing to add is that in the spring, when we had the first wave, our hospitals were under a lot of pressure. Now, all of our hospitals have COVID and non-COVID pathways. So if you uh, have another medical condition, um, yes, you may see as the caseload of COVID increases, you may see non-urgent uh, care, uh, you know, changes to that or, or, or postponement of um, appointments. But the NHS is much better equipped than it was the first time round to deal with people who have to continue to use the NHS for things that have nothing to do with COVID. And, uh, you know, you will still receive care for those things that aren't COVID related. And I think that's very important. I think the system is more robust than it was in the spring. Oh, one of the things which I, which I want to add here is um, I see a lot of international students don't register with the GP when they arrive. Mm -hmm. They take it. Yeah, it's OK. Don't need to you know, register myself until I get ill. So I strongly recommend whichever university, whichever city you go, please, when you arrive, when your quarantine is done, or within that period, because these days they even allow you to register yourself online and sending the documents via email as well. Please register yourself and also follow the university has all the information like Vivian and Bobby mentioned, you know, exactly what to do if you have a COVID symptoms, what to do, if you're non-COVID symptoms, what to do. So, so first thing, register yourself with a GP. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to do um, when you, when you go to a new country, but um, sort of, you know, in the, in the Edboy context, our advisors can, can help you with that. Um, if you don't go through, through an agent or a, or a platform such as, such as Edboy, your university will also have, have support there as well, won't they? Um, so, you know, you've got a support network that you can use, you're not isolated. Um, next question, because I'm, I'm aware of the time. Um, so, um, Question that I've got here is, are the rules flexible enough for the international students to be there and study before the start date of the course? Um, what are the rules if the students are going to fly over there? So I think what this means is, is can a student arrive early to campus um, because it's safer now, to, it's, potential, it's more potential to tra travel now than maybe in a, in a month's time. Um, Vivian, do you have any insights on that? So again, I mean, the advice is talk to your university because they will also, as Bobby's reflected, if you're arriving from a country where you have to enter self-isolation for two weeks, the university will need to manage that process with you. Um, so you need to talk to them about when you can arrive. As Bobby said, many universities are arranging airport pickups, transfers to accommodation, and then making sure that during that two-week um, self-isolation period that um, incoming students are taken care of. Now, it is possible, it is your right as an individual to uh, not to make use of that support, but um, your university will advise you. And Bobby may tell me that, uh, you know, universities have particular rules on how early a student can arrive. Yeah, every university will, will manage it in a slightly different way. So at Portsmouth, we allowed students to arrive two weeks before uh, International Orientation Week. So our International Orientation starts next week. So we, we allowed students to arrive two weeks early and we gave them, if they arrived in that two week, there was a kind of an incentive that we were giving free accommodation for those two weeks. Um, so there was no, no cost to the student from that perspective. Uh, but equally, uh, we have arrival services. So for example, on Saturday, I will be at Heathrow Airport uh, around three o'clock. So if anyone else is there, give me a wave. Um, I'll be there picking up uh, a busload of, uh, I think, around 30 plus students who are uh, arriving. Uh, so every university is, is doing that type of thing where there's arrival services, there's the orientation programs, etc. So contact the university, ask them uh, whether it's for September or January intakes, what are the arrivals, what do they recommend, and they will be able to give you that, that advice and, and what support you can expect when you, when you arrive. Brilliant. Um, next question. Um, is from, from Zahid, who's, who said, what about visa applications during COVID? Um, can I get a visa now for October intake? So I suppose the question is, is it, is it too late? <laughs> um, Bobby, do you have any, no, any insights on that? Yeah, no, it's still, we've, we're still, we're still issuing CASAs right now for our October intake. And because this year we have the flexibility of starting online, that students don't need a visa immediately to travel. So they can start theoretically online whilst their visa application is still being finalized and then travel. 
And because we have this flexible offer this year where you can start online, once they arrive in the UK, even if they're in quarantine isolation for two weeks, they can still be studying in that online environment for the two weeks. And then once they're able to do so, then you know, start interacting with the uh, face-to-face, uh, depending on the course and what's what's being offered. So I think there's there's lots of flexibility. The key again is just to contact the university that you've decided to to study at or you want to study at, and they will be able to tell you exactly uh, how that will all work and, and what's available and what they're doing. But there's there's a lot more flexibility, uh, and everyone's being very flexible uh, this year. Um, our understanding, we had an update, both Vivian and I, yesterday, that uh, the visa processing centers, yes, they're seeing a higher demand at the moment, but there's no particular delays. They're offering more and more services. So some of the priority visas are, are now returning into uh, priority application routes, uh, etc. So things are, are, are working. Uh, there's no particular issues as, as such. Uh, and there is flexibility from the university side as well. So check with your university to see what they've offered. Brilliant. Um, this is an interesting question. I don't, I don't know if we, if we can answer it, but we'll give it a go. Um, how badly is the event management and hospitality tourism sector here? And does it make sense to come for an event management course in the UK next, next semester? Um, Sadiq, do you have any, anything on that? You're a, you're a businessman. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, um, as we all know that you know UK universities, especially you know tourism and, and event management and and the hospitality courses, some of the universities. In fact, Portsmouth is an amazing uh, you know, department for 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 hospitality management. So I I don't you know obviously a lot of courses will be very much uh, um, you know coursework and initially you'll you'll be doing uh, you know some kind of research and, and driven. So I don't think that will have a huge impact. There will be slight impact. But then again, we, we discussed that we're going to a new world now. So everything is going to be different. So, so I'm sure the universities and the lecturer will design the, the program and the approach based on the new world uh, we are looking into. One thing I would like to add here, nothing to stop us going away from our ambition or our vision. The reason for that, I was reading UUKI's website last night, Vivian. I, I was amazed to see every two hours, in the UK, there is a startup company opening in, in, in the university. I mean, every two hours. That is fascinating. You talk about 4,000 startups in every year in the UK universities, adding thousands of jobs, 1.2 billion pounds to the revenue, to the, to, the, to the local economy. That means my message to the international students, I was an international student, I'm an entrepreneur now. Graduate, finding a job, great. Also think about graduate, want to become an entrepreneur, Want to employ people. That's a good way to go forward. I would, I would add. I mean, look. The, the first of all, when you go to university, you're making a, a sort of investment in your long-term career, and we can't tell how long this pandemic is going to be with us. But it is likely that at some point we will come out the other side of the conditions that we're in now. And whilst there may be a lot of event and hospitality businesses that go under during this period inevitably the sector will come back and that means that for those people who are studying now you may actually find yourself graduating in a period where you know there has been a terrible wipeout and there's a lot of opportunity now we don't know that and i don't want to you know pretend that i can predict any more than anybody else can what the labor market will be like when you um, when you emerge. But as Sadiq says, prepare to be an entrepreneur. It could be a great time to be an entrepreneur because when we come out of the other side, there are going to be you know, established businesses that will have disappeared and space for new ones. And, and very true. To that, I think uh, in terms of the hospitality and tourism industry, um, I think we, we all know I'm, I can't wait to go back on holiday. I can't wait to get to... Uh, <laughs> You can imagine a football match. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm so disappointed that first of October is not happening now, uh, in terms of returning for fans to stadiums. So, you know, and I'm not the only one. I know, I know lots of people across the, the UK, across the globe, that will be in a similar position and want, you know, because there, there's a social desire uh, from people to to start doing that. So, I, I can see the hospitality industry at some point in time coming back. I think they will have learned a lot from this period and they will have adapted and there will be new ways of doing things, uh, which is going to be exciting. And I'm sure, again, if you're studying that type of program, 
that you will learn about that and this pandemic is a really great case study of how things operate, what the impact is of a pandemic on, on different industries such as the hospitality industry. But I'm sure based on the interactions and discussions I've had with lots of people and, and knowing how people are, that we would want those opportunities to go back to, to watching and seeing concerts, football matches, going on holidays, etc. Because that's something that uh, we all enjoy and it is, is part of our social fabric and, and something people want to do. Brilliant. Yeah, I think um, one thing we all know is Bobby loves his football, right? <laughs> and, and he supports Manchester City, right, uh, Bobby? Oh, oh. <laughs> Avid Liverpool fan for the, for the attendees. Yeah, <laughs> cool. um, well, we've got through through all the questions there, um, and and we're obviously at, at eleven twenty four um, in the UK. So, so I think we should we should end it there. Um, what I'm going to do is um, we're going to we're going to edit this, and we're going to we're going to send out a recording of it to, to all the participants, um, so they can they can watch it back if needed, as we've spoken about that university lectures do. Um, <laughs> But if you have any further questions, um, feel free to get in touch um, with us at Edfoy. Um, we can always pass your questions along as well to, to people like Vivian and Bobby. I'm sure they'd be happy to, um, to support um, the international student community um, going forward. If there's any, any questions that you have later, feel free just to, to let us know. Um, Matt, Matt I, I want to make a fine, final message to, the, to our fellow international students that we know that UK is, um, Brexit is happening. Frankly, wrongly, so I'm not going to go into the politics. End of this year, our European students will be in the same playing field as our international students. What, I, what that means is, until now, Europeans don't need a visa to work in the UK. From Jan 21, they will be exactly the same as our international students. So that means, so there will be less stress on the international students so far it used to be. So from Jan 21, they are more likely to get more jobs in, in a, um, for the same uh, market. Brilliant. It's, it's interesting. We haven't heard the, um, the Brexit word for a while because of the coronavirus word. Um, but there's definitely, definitely two, two players in that game, isn't there, um, with the, with the um, international student community. So if you have any questions about either of those um, or how they interact with each other with coronavirus and Brexit, feel free to, to send us a message on our socials. They're just um, at Edvoy, Edvoy Global. We can pass them on to the likes of Vivian and Bobby and, and other players um, in the industry. Um, but other than that, um, thanks for your time, Vivian, Bobby and Sadiq, um, and thanks for your time for, for watching as well. Mm -hmm.